Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're kind of down to earth northern lads, you know. Yeah. You know, we just love what we do. We feel incredibly lucky to be still doing it after all these years and, you know, made a decent living out of it. Hi guys, we're here with Paul Humphreys from OMD, headlining today on the Sunday of Forever um, for Young Festival. Um, do you guys still get a rush from headlining festivals? Of course, yeah. I mean, um, you know, we we still we don't need to be doing OMD anymore. We do it because we love to do it, and so we put you know a lot of energy into the shows. We spend a lot of money on the lighting rigs, and because we love doing this, you know, and particularly after the um, pandemic. It's just great to be out doing it again. We've done two tours since since November. We've done the, did a UK tour and we did a tour of a big tour of America. So uh, about sort of three months ago. So wow. it was. Uh, it's just great to be out playing again. So yeah, how do you have the energy for all of that? If you don't mind me asking. Well, you know, we 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 don't tour more than four months of the year now. We used to tour about seven or eight, you know. But, so we've kind of cut it off. Wow. But, uh, <laughs> Fair enough. No, but we. We've reached a certain age, you know, so, and we all got families, and I've, in the lockdown, I had a baby. I know. Oh, congratulations. So, uh, I know, I've got a 30 year old and a one year old now. Wow. Yeah, so, um, obviously, my wife is a bit younger than me, but uh, so I don't want to be away from home, you know, for, you know, four or five months of the year. So, we, we split it up, you know, we, we don't go away for more than six weeks. And then we're home for a bit. So during the pandemic, then were you just spending time with family, or were you were working on music at the same time? Yeah. Well, we yeah we. Um, I mean, Andy and I like to write. We write the songs for the man mostly, you know, and um, and usually we sit in the same room. But I was actually in France, and I couldn't leave France because of the pandemic. And he was in Liverpool and couldn't leave. Liverpool, couldn't go into France. So we tried to sort of start writing songs sort of remotely, sending files, but it's never quite as good. But it just took longer. We've got a few, we've probably got about seven or eight songs for the new album now. Wow, that's so that, great. That we did remotely, but it just takes longer that way. I'd much rather sit in a room with Andy and then he'd rather sit in a room with me and we play, you know. That's how we basically write everything. But uh, so, you know, we made use of the time. And obviously I had a baby, my wife got pregnant, so that took up some time as well. Sure did, yeah. <laughs> and it's amazing that you and Andy have still got like this long-lasting creative relationship and friendship. Yeah, well we go back, we were seven when we met, you know, yeah, we were seven years old. Yeah, school. We went to primary school together. Oh, so, uh, so we're like brothers, really. Oh. You know? Do you have like, do you remember your first impression of him, age seven? Was it harsh? Um, Rather not say, I'll come in. No, no, I was just kidding. I mean, <laughs> now the thing was, Andy's like nine months older than me. Oh, okay. So he was an academic year uh, okay. above from me. So we kind of used to play around at the playground, football and stuff, but we weren't in the same classes together. So uh, but uh, so I didn't really probably get to know him until I was about 15. Okay. And, uh, and my friends were in a band and uh, they needed a bass player and I used to see Andy walking around uh, the, the, our local town with a bass over his shoulder. I'm not, I wasn't even sure if he could play it. I think he was just posing with his bass. You know? yeah. So I, I knocked on his door and said, "Do you want to play bass in a band?" You know. And then, um, but then we realised that we had, uh, you know, a lot in common. We were the only two people on the Wirral Peninsula where we grew up that liked electronic music mm. and craft work and all the German stuff. Yeah, yeah. So then we became. You know, great friends and uh, yeah. started making music together and done it ever since. Yeah, and like I think it's so impressive reading back about everything with synthesizers, like things like dancing on stage, the relationship with critics is very interesting. And yeah. you see electronic music, even now sometimes gets a bit of a bad rep. I mean, it's quite yeah. new to be nominated for Grammys and everything like that. Like, yeah. you're still a hardcore defender of electronic music. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, when we first started, I mean, hardly anyone was using synthesizers apart from, you know, Genesis and Emerson, Lake and Barber and stuff. And they were all doing all these noodly things. It was only, you know, Kraftwerk sort of showed the way. But it was never considered real music because it didn't have guitars, it didn't have acoustic drums, you know. So we were battling against, you know, uh, you know, critics saying, it, how, can, how can this be real music? Know, it's a, this noodling and the synthesizers write the song for you and all this kind of nonsense that we have, which of course you know they still can't now. Yeah, you know, yeah, of course. Never mind in the mid seventies. Yeah, I like so how you have you, to still write it. Yeah, I like. Do you find a way to push through reading criticism and, and critics? Are like, how do oh, you kind of push through? I don't give a damn about critics. <laughs> yeah. It's probably the I, best attitude. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, because some of our what I consider to be our greatest works got hammered at the time. Really? By the critics. Okay. So it's like, well, 
I still think those, and, and strangely, some of those things that got hammered at the time are now lauded as our masterpieces by the critics, you know. Okay. So. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so I think we were just kind of, because we were trying to push the boundaries, you know, of, of what you could do with music and electronic music and try to introduce these new sounds and, and ideas into the world. Yeah. And there was only a few of us doing it, like, you know, obviously some German bands, Kraftwerk, but there's Human League, um, us, um, Gary Newman. Yeah. Simple Minds. Uh, uh, Simple Minds, and then a little bit after that, um, Depression. And, um, Depression yeah. and, uh, yeah. and you guys uh, supported a lot Yazoo of them. Was, Joy Division, you know, do yeah, you have good memories well, of them? Oh, I have amazing memories of Joy Division. In fact, uh, someone sent me a book yesterday, actually, a friend of mine. There's a new book out by Kevin Cummings, photographer, and it just documents Joy Division. And I was going through it only, only last night, actually, going, wow, I was just remembering all these things, because we were on Factory, you know, and we, we toured with them for a year. Yeah. We yeah. did the factory tours, you know, and yeah. so there was us, Joy Division, a certain ratio on the bill. And we toured all over the UK and got to know them really well and got to know Ian really well. So I was kind of gutted when he died because I, I kind of got fairly close to him. You know, so. mm, yeah, like I, I read and heard how the music as well, like your guys' music changed a little bit after he died. and. Yeah. It seems like a little bit linked, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, it did. In fact, our, our second album, Organization, was really totally influenced by, uh, by Joy Division. Wow, and, uh, that's very cool. And by Ian. And I think, I think, funnily enough, Joy Division were influenced by us because they started, you know, introducing a lot of synths, synths. Into, their, uh, into their music, so. Yeah, and now synths are huge, like, huge, huge part of music. Well, they've permeated every aspect of Everything. music, haven't they? I mean, even yeah. from rap music to R&B to, mm. you know, most of the backing tracks are, are you know, computer generated. You know, yeah. One way or another, the synthesizers. And it's, like, I was reading all the people who credit you, you guys as influences, and it's obviously crazy names, crazy names, LCD sound system, you know, all of these hot chip. Do you, yeah. did you let, you know, how do you not let that get to your head and be like, well, we started all these amazing bands, not started, well, but you know. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's great, but it's like a continuation, isn't it? Uh, and, like we looked at Kraftwerk and Neu and La Dusseldorf and all these kind of obscure German bands and they, they sort of set the tone for us. They, that was, that was our blueprint for our, yeah. for our band. And, and so it continues. And so we've, We've taken influences from them and other people take influences from us and that's music you know because mm. no one should be like this with music you should need to be switched on and take mm. take influences from around you you know so. yeah. and have you got any of your kind of top pinch me moments uh, i think meeting Kraftwerk. yeah that must have been crazy <laughs> but the weird thing was was that it was in 1980 we were still kids it was like you know 19 <laughs> and he was 20. Yeah. You know? and um and uh, they no one told us they were coming. We did this tiny little club in Bochum because we weren't very big then. But obviously Kraftwerk had heard about us. And uh, I remember walking out on stage and there was like this balcony. So it was a small club. The balcony was like, like where the camera is. You know? And I looked out and, and they're all, all four Kraftwerk guys were all folded arms staring at us. It's like God had come to the gig, you know. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and I went, ah, oh, Kraftwerk are here. And I was trying to show Andy, like, look. <laughs> now I was just playing away. Yeah, so, and then they came backstage and met them and stuff. And, yeah, that's incredible. And do you think but, people have been starstruck by you then? Is that very surreal? I mean, maybe. I don't know. We're, <laughs> we're kind of down to earth northern lads, you know. Yeah. You know, we just love what we do. We feel incredibly lucky to be still doing it after all these years and, you know, made a decent living out of it. And I was reading bits about your, um, the 2018 autobiography that you guys had as well. And um, Adam Clayton from U2 gave some of his te like testimonies, if you will. Um, did you guys come into contact with many Irish bands from the 80s and 90s? Funny so thing, right? We did, um, we did um, what's it called? The Electric Ballroom in London yeah. in 1980. And uh, Talking Heads were top of the bill. And it was just supposed to be us and the Talking Heads, right? Yeah. And they added another band on at the last minute. And uh, there's some Irish band who had just playing their first gig in the UK. And uh, we went out to see them, of course it's you too. <laughs> and then they, they fired up with Sunday Bloody Sunday and Andy and I went, I think this band are going somewhere, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but they were lovely guys, you know, yeah. we kind of kept in touch for a while, I haven't seen them for a while, but. Yeah, um, so just have one or two more questions. Um, first of all, the story behind you guys writing a, a track in less than 24 hours for Pretty and Pink. Oh yeah. I love this story, oh, if you would mind was, telling it again. It was terrifying actually, because uh, 
because John Hughes, we, we'd worked with John Hughes uh, before the director, the producer, yeah. because he did, you know, 16 Candles and stuff, and he did uh, Weird Science, and he put our song Tesla Girls in Weird Science. We didn't specifically write it for him, but he chose it because it fitted with the film. Uh, but then, um, after the success of Simple Minds, uh, which Don't You Forget About Me, yeah. uh, he thought, let's get, a, let's get O and B to do the next one, which is Pretty in Pink. Yeah. So, Andy and I spent three months writing a song, right? And it was about, um, it was two days before we started an American tour in San Francisco. And we flew to LA with a tape of the recording just to mix it in the studio, which only takes a day and a bit, you know. And uh, this is before mobile phones, so we get, we get to the hotel and there's an urgent message, John Hughes, call me, you know, so okay, okay, call him. Yeah. <laughs> what is it, John? Uh, sorry, guys, but your song doesn't work in the film now because I've changed the whole ending. Can you write me a new one? Oh it's like, God. you are kidding me. We spent three months get on this. I said, well, I'm sorry, if you want to be in the film, you've got to write us a new song. We said, we don't really have any equipment. It's all gone to San Francisco. So, so I'll book you into the best studio in LA, hire whatever you want, and write me a new song. <laughs> so, uh, so we were like jet lagged because we just flown in from London. Like, okay, you go into the studio. I sat at the piano before the hire company delivered the gear. I sat at the piano, Andy started scribbling words, and we wrote a few leave. You know, in, in about eight hours. And, and it was okay, and we, we, we thought it was okay, and so, sort of about four in the morning, we got a bike to, to bike a cassette over to him, went to bed, eight o'clock the phone rings, it's great, get back in the studio <laughs> to finish it. Wow. So we had another day to finish it, and that was it. Wow, that's amazing. But, you know, we were lucky, because nine times out of ten, I mean, it's one of our biggest hits, it's yeah. makes, you know, particularly it's massive in America, Canada, South America, you yeah. know, it's... Uh, yeah. yeah, so um, I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, nine times out of ten you'll write a piece of crap, really. But we just got lucky in that one moment. We wrote a really good song. You know? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess my last question, do you have any favorite fan interactions? And then what do you see in your future as o &D? Um First of all, fan interactions. Um, for the 40th anniversary, we decided to do a book. Yeah. And... Um, we thought rather than it be like, you know, then they did this and then they did that, and there was already a book out, and you can find all that kind of information out on, on Google if you want to know what we did over the years. So it's pointless having a book about it. So we thought, why don't we get the fans to write the book for us? And so we put it out to the fans to say, what does OMD mean to you? And, uh, and we got these amazing stories back. That we, the book is like this, you know. Just, you know, all these stories of what the songs meant, you know. They played this at my father's funeral. The, this song got through, uh, this song got me through a really tough time. You know, I, I, you know, people who had met at OMD gigs and now have three kids, you wow. know. And, you know, all these great stories, you know. So, um, you know, the fans are what, it, what it's all about. Without fans, you're nothing, you know. So we try to kind of interact as much as we can with the fans. And, uh, and they all love to be part of it. That book made the, all our sort of, you know, all, all our hardcore fans feel part of us because they contributed to this wonderful book, you know. So what was the other question, sorry? What is it in your future? Future, you? well... Seeing as we're at a futuristic festival right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, health being there. It's a bit worrying, you know, a few, few people have dropped this year, you know. Yeah. And, um, Andy Fletcher, who I knew really well, just went yeah. recently. In fact, we, we did... Um, we were on stage in LA when we found this out, or just before we really? went on, um, we did our last show in this big Greek theatre place. And so we come to get a picture to put up and, and did a tribute to him on stage, because, um, you know, I, I used to know him really well. We toured with Depeche in the 80s, you know, so. But yeah, so health, you know, <laughs> health staying with us, we'll, we'll keep going. I mean, what else are we gonna do? You know, we love what we do. I mean, this is what I said to you at the beginning. You know, we don't have to do this anymore. We do it because we love it. You know, and we're a, we're a happy family. You know, even our crew are our mates, even though they're highly technical. You know, they're, we've, we've kind of got together a crew now who are brilliant at what they do, but they're good friends as well now. So, so you know, we we love we love getting out on the road and we all have a good time. And as long as that continues, as long as we have a good time, as long as we have our health, as long as people want to come and see us, then we'll keep playing. Great. Well, best of luck headlining, closing out uh, for Yeah, I'm looking festival. forward to it. Great, thank you so much for coming along. No, thank you for talking to me. <laughs> okay.